Are you doing well? Is God good? All the time. I just want to take a moment to make sure I have this PowerPoint up here safely. Uh, if you'll give me just one moment. Ah, there we are. Before I begin, I'd like to share greetings from my wife. Her name is Lucille. We have, she is not here, <laughs> but she sends her love. Uh, next month, we will be celebrating our 45th wedding anniversary. So I'm probably older than I look. Probably older than you think I am. All right, praise the Lord. I am here and I'm going to share with you training for special forces, kingdom of God. So this is not going to be your ordinary Sunday service, but this is boot camp. Special Forces, Kingdom of God, and also Bahrain and the Philippines. Are you ready for this? Yeah. Actually, this is the wrong one. This is not, can I have this over here, please? I'm sorry, I got the wrong PowerPoint presentation. Can you bring that over here, this TV? Yeah, so everyone can see it. That's as far as you can go? Oh yeah, try to get it as close as possible to me, right next to me if possible, okay? I'm going to be using a PowerPoint presentation to teach from morning until evening. Some of you may want to have this PowerPoint presentation. If you would like to have it, please send me an email. And my email is up there, Elijah003 at gmail.com. Just bring it as close as possible to me. Ah, there we go. My email is Elijah003 at gmail.com. Please write that down, especially if you are interested in having this PowerPoint presentation for free. This training could take 10 hours, okay? There's a lot of material here, and uh, much of it will be new for you. And if you would like to have a record of this, send me an email. And by the way, this presentation is also available on YouTube. And right there, you can see the link by which you can watch this YouTube video. Now, let me share with you my testimony. In 1978, my wife and I left the United States. Oh, by the way, you're probably wondering where I am from, because I don't look like an American. I look like I'm from Asia somewhere. I was born in the United States, state of New Jersey. My parents immigrated from China in the 1930s, and there I was born in the United States. That's why I talk like this. So, uh, in America, they call us ABCs, American Born Chinese. Okay. In 1978, my wife and I, we left the United States and we went to Indonesia as missionaries. And there, we preached the gospel in unreached villages. They were very primitive, and some of these places were actually close to the jungle. And these places, had no electricity, the people had never heard the name of Jesus. They were idol worshippers, ancestor worshippers, and some were Muslims. And when we would share the gospel with them, we tell them about Jesus, and then they never heard of Jesus. And we would tell them who he was, what he did for them, and they would say, well, this Jesus sounds great, but what can he do for me right now? A witch doctor put a curse on me, and I have constant pain in my eye. Can your Jesus help me? Now, when I heard that, I was so excited. Because ever since I was baptized in the Holy Spirit in 1970, 
7, I wanted to see the miracles that I saw in the Gospels and in the book of Acts. I wanted to see the glory of God. I wanted to do the miracles that I saw the disciples doing in the Gospels in the book of Acts. And so when this lady asked, can your Jesus help me? I was so excited. I said, wow, here's my chance. So of course I had studied the Gospels. I had studied exactly how Jesus healed the sick. I laid hands on her. And I said, in the name of Jesus, I rebuke this pain, this unclean spirit. Leave her right now in Jesus' name. Be healed now. And then we asked her, how do you feel? So usually you never ask the person how do they feel, right? You just say, God bless you. Uh, see you next week. I hope you feel better. But I dare to ask this woman, how do you feel? Why? Because I expected something to happen. When Jesus healed the sick, did he expect miracles? Yes or no? Yes, he obviously expected miracles to happen. And so that's exactly what I had in my heart. I said, how do you feel? And the woman said, when you laid hands on me, I felt this wonderful sensation in my eye. And it slowly moved down into my heart. When it moved, when it touched my heart, I felt so wonderful. And the pain that I was feeling in my eye is completely gone. I am healed. And she was one of the first converts to Jesus Christ. Later, almost her entire family accepted Christ. Within three months of our arrival at this village, we had planted two churches with about 50 born-again believers. And at that time, I was a new believer. I had just been baptized in the Holy Spirit. That was the key. And so that was uh, 40 years ago. Okay? We have come a long way since then. Okay? And now, God has called me to teach exactly what we did as missionaries in the villages 40 years ago. How to heal the sick miraculously, how to cast out demons exactly as Jesus did, as evidence to the world that He is in fact the Messiah. And that's what I'm going to be teaching you. What is the purpose of this training? Here, let me give it to you straight. In the Elijah Challenge training, you will be taught primarily how to heal the sick and cast out demons as Jesus did in the Gospels as evidence that He was the Messiah. So yes, we are going to learn how to heal the sick, but it will be for a very specific purpose. The purpose will be to show to the world, to unbelievers, to those outside the church, the miracles as evidence, as proof that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the only way to the Father. That's the primary purpose of this training. It is not to minister healing to sick believers. Now, I was a pastor for many years, and I understand that when pastors have sick sheep, they, we want to minister healing to the sheep. Yes, I understand that. But the primary purpose of this is not simply to minister healing to sick believers in the church, but it is to minister healing to people outside the church. When they see the miracles, then they will believe that Jesus Christ is the Messiah, the Son of God, the only way to the Father. So please keep that in mind. I'm not just going to teach you how to minister healing to each other. That's okay, but that's not my primary purpose. My primary purpose is for you to be trained to fulfill the Great Commission. Amen. For example, in the Philippines, is the Philippines already reached with the Gospel, yes or no? Yes or no? Is the Philippines reached? Have you fulfilled the Great Commission in the Philippines, yes or no? Come on, be honest. Yes or no? I don't think so. You know what Jesus said, this gospel of the kingdom must be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, all people groups. Have you reached all people groups in the Philippines with the gospel? No. From what I understand, there are a lot of Catholics. <laughs> are they reached? Are they born again? They're Catholics? I don't think so. So you have a lot of work yet to be done in the Philippines, do you not? Okay. So I'm going to train you to fulfill the Great Commission, to make disciples of all nations, to preach the Gospel in the whole world as a testimony to all nations, to make disciples of all nations. That's the purpose of this training. Amen? Great Commission, Great Commission, Great Commission. Not just healing for the sake of healing,
but to fulfill the great commission during these last days. Amen. Do you believe that we're in the last days? Yes or no? Yes. yes. From what we have seen happening in the world, we believe we are in the last days. Are we close to fulfilling the great commission? For example, here in Bahrain. Are we close to fulfilling the great commission here in Bahrain? Yes or no? Come on, wake up. No, far from fulfilling the Great Commission here in Bahrain. You know what I'm talking about, right? Yeah. But we believe we're in the last days, meaning the time is short, but so much work needs to be done, right? In the Middle East, in India, in the Philippines, in Africa. Africa, the birthplace of witchcraft. Okay, so many Africans believe in witchcraft. So how are we going to fulfill the Great Commission during these last days? We have to learn how to preach the gospel as Jesus did. We have to learn how to heal the sick as Jesus, as Jesus did, as evidence that he was the Messiah. So what we are going to do is we are going to study how Jesus trained and commanded his disciples to heal the sick as they proclaimed the kingdom of God to the lost. And so, I'm here not to just train leaders or servants of God or evangelists or missionaries, but every one of you here, every one of you here, I'm here to train every one of you, because all of you are witnesses of Jesus Christ. All of you are to preach the gospel to someone. Amen? Amen? Amen. Amen. Why are you saved? What's the purpose of your being saved? Yes, saved someday, you're going to be in the presence of the Lord. But you know, you are saved to serve. You are saved to be a witness of Jesus Christ to the nations. And I'm going to train you to be an effective witness to unbelievers by teaching you how to perform miracles. Did you hear me? I'm going to teach you how to perform miraculous healings in the name of Jesus as evidence to unbelievers that our God is the only true God and that Jesus is the only way to Him. Because no false gods can do the miracles that our God can do. Missions, as in Acts, is being restored today. If you have read the book of Acts, you have read about all of the great miracles that took place through the early disciples. But today, it seems like the book of Acts is just history. It's just description. It's no longer prescription of what the church should be doing. Uh, in the Philippines, for example, do you see the book of Acts being done? Do you see great miracles like in the book of Acts in the Philippines today? Yes or no? no? No, you don't. But let me tell you, we are in the last days. God is restoring missions as recorded in the book of Acts. Today, 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 today. We are privileged to be living in the last days during which there will be an acceleration in missions. Missions as in the book of Acts is being restored today, meaning the miracles that we see reported in the book of Acts, resulting in great harvest of souls in the book of Acts, they're being restored today. Now, today, the church does not teach us to minister healing to the sick as Jesus did and as he taught his disciples. I repeat, today, the church does not teach us how to minister healing effectively as Jesus did and as he taught and commanded his disciples. Instead, what the church teaches us is a lot of tradition thrown in to the ministry of healing. The ministry of healing as taught by the church today is not biblical and that's why we don't see many miracles. We don't see many miracles like we see in the Bible. Correct? Correct? Yes. Whose fault is that? Is it God's fault? Did he take away the miracles? Is it God's fault? Did Jesus say no more miracles? No. So whose fault is it that there are no that there are very few miracles? If it's not God's fault, then whose fault is it? Our fault is the fault of the church. The church is not training disciples as Jesus trained his disciples. Okay? So what we are going to do is we are going to study exactly how Jesus healed the sick. Determine the principles, and when we apply those principles, you will see people miraculously healed. And the primary purpose will be for those outside the church. 
that they may repent of their sin and put their faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and receive eternal life. You see, in English we have this saying, practice makes perfect. Have you ever heard that saying? Practice makes perfect. Actually, that's not true. Practice makes permanent. <laughs> if you practice something in the wrong way, what do you get? Yeah, you do it in the wrong way permanently, okay? And so it is so important that when we practice, we have to practice the right way. When we heal the sick, we have to heal the sick the way Jesus did, and that will make perfect. The problem is, the way we minister to the sick is not what Jesus taught. As I mentioned earlier, we have mixed in a lot of traditions. And so the church, for centuries, we've been ministering to a way, in a way which is not biblical. We've thrown in traditions to the way we've been ministering to the sick. I'll make that clear in a moment. And so now, when you minister to the sick, the way you do it is not biblical. That's why you don't see any miracles. You've been doing it for 10, 20, 30 years, as long as you've been going to the church, and now it's permanent. It's permanent. The way you minister to the sick is permanently wrong and not biblical. Amen. But I'm going to reverse that today. All right? We're going to look at exactly how Jesus ministered to the sick. And so you're going to, eventually, you're going to abandon the traditions that you have been taught and you're going to minister to the way Jesus did. But let me give you a caveat. What I'm going to be teaching you is going to be a new paradigm for most of you here. Most of you here, when you minister to the sick, you do it in a very traditional way, which is not biblical, but it has become permanent in you. It has become a habit. And bad habits are very hard to break. Very hard to break. It takes time to break the bad habit and to follow the Bible, to follow how Jesus did it. And so, generally, it is not accomplished in simply one day. It doesn't work in just one day. You have to receive this teaching over and over and over and over and over again before it really sinks in. And then you begin truly to heal the sick as Jesus did. So I am here for just one day. Take it as an introduction. But actually, it will not be enough. Okay? Let me share, I'll share with you what we did in India. The training is two months. It's two months. Okay. But anyway, let's, let's introduce this. Okay? Now, exactly how did Jesus train his disciples? Mark 1, verse 6. Jesus left there and went to his hometown accompanied by his disciples. So we see that wherever Jesus went, his disciples would accompany him. They would follow him. Verse 2, when the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue, and many who heard him were amazed. So here, in the Sabbath, he began to teach and his disciples were there to listen to his teaching. And many who heard the teaching were amazed. Now, why were they amazed? Because the teaching was no ordinary teaching. It was not just with words alone. There was something else there that amazed the people. It was not simply words. Where did this man get these things, they asked? What's this wisdom that has been given him? What are these remarkable miracles he is performing? And so you see, his teaching consisted not only of words, but of remarkable miracles. He was healing the sick miraculously. He was casting out demons. The people were amazed. And so when Jesus taught, it was not just with words alone. And typically when we teach, it's usually just words, right? It's just words, a lot of talk, a lot of talk, and words are important. But when Jesus taught, it was not simply words, it was accompanied by miracles which amazed the people. Okay, so as he was teaching, he was doing miracles. Sick people were being healed. Demonized people were being set free. That was his teaching, all right? Then he went around teaching from village to village. So Jesus did not stay in a single place. He went from village to village, and his disciples accompanied him from village to village, where he would do what? Preach the gospel, heal the sick, 
cast out demons. That is how Jesus trained his disciples. He took them around with him, and when he healed the sick, when he preached the gospel, when he cast out demons, his disciples were watching him, observing him, and learning to do what he did. Amen? Amen. That's how he trained them. He did not send them to seminary for three years, but he took them with him and showed them the things that he did, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out demons from village to village. So this is how Jesus trained his disciples. It was not in the classroom, no classroom, but it was on the battlefield itself, in the villages, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, casting out demons. Now, look at Luke 9, verse 1. When Jesus had called the twelve together, he gave them power and authority to drive out all demons and to cure diseases. When Jesus healed the sick, he often used supernatural power and authority to heal the sick and cast out demons. And here, in Luke 9, he calls the twelve disciples and he gives them this very same supernatural power and authority over all demons and diseases. So here, he not only teaches them how to do it, he gives them the power and authority to do so. He enables them to heal the sick and cast out demons by giving them his supernatural power and authority to drive out demons and to cure diseases. Amen? And then verse 2, he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God and to heal the sick, exactly as he did. So what was the purpose of this power and authority? Was it to go from church to church having healing services for believers? Was that the purpose of this power and authority? To go from church to church and heal sick believers? Was that the purpose? Come on, someone tell me. No. The purpose was to proclaim the kingdom of God to the lost. And as they proclaimed the kingdom of the lost, they were to heal the sick miraculously, exactly as he did, as evidence that he was the Messiah, the only way to the Father. Is that clear? So this power and authority is for outside the church, for preaching the gospel to unbelievers, unbelievers, unbelievers. And so they obeyed Jesus. So they, meaning the twelve, they set out and went from village to village, proclaiming the good news and healing people everywhere, just as Jesus did. So after Jesus trained them by taking them from place to place and showing them how he preached the gospel, healed the sick and cast out demons, and after he gave them this power and authority, and then he commanded them, go, and they obeyed. And they actually went from village to village, preaching the gospel and healing people everywhere. They were performing miraculous healings everywhere. Should we be doing this today, especially in the Philippines? Amen. Are there any villages in the Philippines which have not been reached? Yeah. Many or few? Many. <laughs> Are you going to be doing this someday after you go back home? Yes or no? Come on. Come on. Are you going to be doing this? Are you a disciple of Jesus Christ? Are you going to obey his command? Yes or no? Who says yes? I see some of you are smiling, meaning I'm going to raise my hand, but no, I'm not really going to do this. Are you kidding? Crazy. You think I'm going to do this? I will change your mind, okay? I'm going to change your mind today. And it's going to start right here. So, these disciples, they healed the sick exactly as Jesus did. Exactly as Jesus did. That's the key here. We do not heal the sick exactly as Jesus did. We have all kinds of traditions that we have thrown in. And that's why we don't see many miracles. We're not following Jesus. Instead, we're following our church traditions. Luke 10, verse 1, after this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. 
So after Jesus trained the 12 and sent them out, now he trains 72 more disciples. And these are not apostles. These are ordinary disciples like you and me. And he sends them out from place to place. Did he give them any of this supernatural power and authority? Did he give to the 72 this ability? Or was it only for the 12 apostles? Verse 9. Heal the sick who are there and tell them the kingdom of God has come near to you. Jesus commanded the 72 to heal the sick. He did not say pray for the sick. He said heal the sick. So did Jesus give to the 72 any of this supernatural power and authority to heal the sick and cast out demons? Yes or no? Yes. Yes. Yes, absolutely. If he didn't give them this supernatural power and authority, he would command them to pray to God for the sick and leave the results up to God. But he didn't say pray to God and ask God to heal the sick. He said, you heal the sick, which means to the 72 disciples, he also gave this supernatural power and authority. Now, these 72 disciples represent you and me. Represent you and me. Maybe there's not many apostles here. I don't think so. Anyway, we are mostly ordinary disciples represented by these 72. To. And what happened? So they went out, verse 17, and then they returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. When they came back from their mission trip, they were so full of joy because they had seen people healed. They had seen miracles. They had seen demons cast out. And they said, Jesus, wow, glory to God. Even those demons submit to us in your name. And this is what you are going to experience when you go back home to the Philippines and you go on a mission trip. You are going to come back to your home and you're going to say, wow, I saw miracles. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? Do you believe you're going to see this if you obey God? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Okay. Now, you see, when, you, when a believer does this, it's exciting to be a believer. It's very exciting because you see Jesus work through you in the miraculous. You see good people healed and delivered and saved. And the Christian walk becomes very exciting. But if all you do is go to church once a week, you know how boring that is. You know how boring that is. Do you know how boring that is just going to church once a week? Oh, it is boring. I've been a pastor. I know what I'm talking about. And so I'm going to challenge you, all of you, to become disciples of Jesus Christ, just like these. Okay. Let me just share with you what we have done in India. We are, we are quite active in India. In India, over the last year, every two months, we trained 12 disciples in exactly the same way, just like Jesus trained his disciples. And after that, we sent them two by two to an unreached village in India. So, the first month we chose 12 disciples and then we trained them just like Jesus trained his disciples. We took them from place to place where we would heal the sick and preach the gospel and cast out demons and these 12 disciples were with us and they would learn to do what we were doing. They saw us, they observed us, we were teaching them, so they learned to do what we did. After two months, we would tell them, now, go. We would send them two by two to some completely unreached village. And they would go in and do the same thing that they saw us do. You got that? So after the two months, after we had sent out the first batch of 12 disciples, then we chose a second batch of 12 disciples and repeated the process for two more months. And after the two months, we would send out the second batch of 12 disciples and say, now go to that unreached area, preach the gospel, heal the sick, cast out demons, plant a house church. And then we would take a third batch of 12 disciples and repeat the process, okay? So over a year, we trained six times 12 or 72 disciples in that way. And we sent them out to preach the gospel, heal the sick, and proclaim the kingdom of God. Let me give you the results. The result was 100 house churches planted in a single year with 3,000 new believers after one year. 
We didn't send them to Bible school, but we just trained them for two months and sent them out. And this was what they accomplished. And this will increase exponentially. You know why? Because these 72 harvest workers, now they're going to train other believers, just like we trained them. They're going to train other believers, and those believers will be sent out. And so trained harvest workers can be multiplied exponentially, which means an exponential increase in the harvest as well. I challenge you, when you get back home to the Philippines or to Kenya, you do the same thing. And, and what about Bahrain? Okay, later, I will talk about Bahrain, what you can do here at Bahrain. Of course, Bahrain is very different, obviously, but I have some things to say about Bahrain as well. Uh, based on my experience in Indonesia, which has more Muslims than any other country on earth. Okay. Amen. Let me share with you some actual reports from our trained disciples. Okay, These are not famous evangelists. These are ordinary disciples who were trained over two months. Let me share with you some typical reports that we received from them. Okay. In a village called Singha, there was a woman who was demonized and unable to walk for 10 days. Her family brought in a sorcerer, but he could do little to help. Two of our Elijah Challenge workers ministered to her in the name of Jesus Christ. The demon left her, and she was able to walk. That family accepted Christ. Typical result. In that village also, was a, there was a demon disturbing a family, causing them to be unable to sleep at night. They would be awoken by knocking on their door, when they answered the door, there would be no one, and they would hear all kinds of unusual sounds. Okay. So this family was under attack by demonic forces. Our workers went and ministered in their homes, staying for two nights. So these workers, when they went there, they didn't just pray a, a, a 30 second prayer and say, God bless you, I hope you feel better. No, 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 no. They stayed there for two nights, rebuking these demonic forces in the name of Jesus. And that's what I'm going to teach you. Persistence. You don't give up until the enemy has left. Then you can leave. After that, there were no more strange sounds and no more knocking on their door. Praise the Lord. Fifteen people accepted Jesus in that village. Our workers have started a house church there. So how long did it take to start this house church? Two days. <laughs> Two days. When the miracle took place, 15 people accepted Christ, and you have a house church right there. Okay. This is what happens when you have miracles. And Jesus gives us this supernatural power and authority to perform those miracles. On his way to his ministry field, one of our disciples saw a man with a horribly swollen neck. So he stopped and asked him what had happened to his neck. The man replied that he had cancer. He had a huge cancerous tumor around his neck, causing his neck to swell up like a balloon. Despite the poverty in which they lived, the family had spent the equivalent of over US 400,000 for treatment, but to no avail. $4,000 is a lot of money for these poor village people. His neck was swollen like a balloon. Okay. Can you imagine that? This train worker, he sees a man with cancer in his neck. His neck is swollen like a balloon, and he wants to minister to him. Does it take boldness to do that? Usually you want to stay away from such cases, right? <laughs> Say, no, thank you. God have mercy on you. But we trained our believers that you have this supernatural power and authority. You can heal the sick miraculously. You can cast out demons. So you don't run away. You face the enemy. You heal the sick. You cast out demons. And then you preach the gospel. So our worker asked if he could visit him at his home, where he would pray over him for healing and also share the gospel with him. So this worker, he had the temerity to say, oh, can I come over to your house? I'm going to lay hands on you. Does it take boldness to do that? 
usually you say, no, thank you, you know, God bless you, God have mercy on you, and you hope you never see that person again, right? No, we teach our workers, the bigger they are, the harder they fall, <laughs> all right? The man agreed. The next day in the evening, two of our trained workers went to his home where they ministered to him for over an hour. Over an hour, not just a one minute prayer and then God bless you. No, they ministered to him for one hour. They said that they would come back the following day because the man was not healed. After one hour, they said, okay, we're gonna come back tomorrow. You see, I'm gonna teach you, disciples do not give up, amen? amen. Disciples do not give up. But when they were about to leave, the cancerous tumor on his neck burst before their eyes like a balloon. The family members were amazed. He was completely healed. The entire family came to Christ. Okay? This is what properly trained workers can do. These workers do not have a special gift. No, 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 no. They do not have a special gift but they have been properly trained in the use of supernatural power and authority, which all of you already have. All of you already have the supernatural power and authority, but no one has ever taught you how to use it properly to heal the sick in the context of sharing the gospel with the lost. All of you already have this power and authority. This is no one ever told you. Or maybe if someone did tell you you have it, but they didn't tell you how to use it. They didn't teach you how to actually fire the weapon. I'm going to teach you how to fire the weapon. This is training for special forces, kingdom of God. I'm going to teach you how to use the deadly weapons God has given you for proclaiming the kingdom of God. In another village called Fasala, there were eight people in a family. They would all suffer from various problems, sometimes from fever, from pain in their legs, from bad dreams, etc. They thought it was the work of demons, so they called a sorcerer who had them sacrifice a goat and a chicken. They also paid the sorcerer to perform other acts of worship, but nothing happened. In the Philippines, do you have sorcerers and witch doctors? Yes or no? Many of you. Many. Okay, so this is nothing new for you, right? Nothing new at all. Okay. Our workers went there and threw out all the items used in idol worship and then ministered to the family members using power and authority. Our Lord graciously delivered that family from the demonic attacks. Okay. In a village, there was a child with a swollen stomach along with some physical abnormalities. Okay, so this child apparently was born with physical abnormalities, okay? Congenital defects. His father and mother took him to a hospital and for a few months, he was taking medication prescribed for him, but there was no change. They called for a sorcerer and asked him to help. He gave the child some medicine in addition to performing some sacrifices, but it did not work out. Praise the Lord, the child was completely healed and became normal after our worker ministered to him. The abnormality disappeared. The family believed on Jesus Christ and accepted him as Lord and Savior. Do you think you can do these things when you go back home to the Philippines? Yes or no? Yes or no? Say, yes, I can. Yes, I can. Because Jesus commands me to do these things. All right? In a completely unreached Hindu village, now, these villages are completely unreached, okay? There's no believers there. They're either Hindu or animist. In a completely unreached Hindu village, there was a man who had been very weak over a period of three years. He had difficulty walking and was so helpless he could hardly do anything. The family took him to a doctor who did several scans and other tests, but he did not find anything. They tried various treatments, including allopathic medicine, but there was no improvement. The family heard about our Elijah Challenge workers and called them for prayer. Two of our brothers went to the village and began ministering to the man in the name of Jesus Christ. To their surprise, all of a sudden the man's wife started shouting, I will kill him and will not let him go. 
That's the wife. <laughs> That's the wife. The demon speaking through the wife. For a few minutes, non-stop, the demon manifests itself through the wife, shrieking and screeching. Our United Challenge workers calmly ministered to both of them with authority in Jesus' name, and the demon came out of the man and his wife. Following this extraordinary deliverance, the man was able to walk. The whole family, as well as one of the relatives, accepted our Lord Jesus. A new fellowship or house church has started up in that village. So you see, it doesn't take months to start a house church. You can start a house church in one visit, as long as you understand how to heal the sick and cast out demons, perform miracles. There was an elderly woman who was suffering from heart disease for two years. After our worker ministered to her, she was miraculously healed. Do we have anyone here with a heart condition? Anyone here with a heart condition? And you would like to be miraculously healed? Raise your hand high. You have a heart condition, is that right, sister? Yes? No, you don't, okay. Anyone have a heart condition? And you want to be miraculously healed? Oh, what a shame, there's no one here with a heart condition. Okay, we'll have to wait. A total of 14 house churches have been planted in the month of February. One month, 14 house churches. Is this possible in the Philippines, yes or no? Yes. Philippines would be even easier, actually, because the Philippines is a Catholic country. India is mostly Hindu. They are more resistant to the gospel than Catholics. So. The Philippines, you should be able to bear even more fruit. Amen? You want to do this? You really want to do this? Yes. Or you yeah. just want to fall, and fall asleep in church every Sunday when you go back home? No, you're not going to fall asleep in church anymore. You're going to go out and fulfill the Great Commission. Amen? Amen. Good. This report I received just earlier this year, February, March. Again, this is the fruit that we saw. Uh, in addition to this approach, where we send out workers two by two, we also do something called feeding events. And since the year 2015, we have seen about 60,000 decisions for Jesus Christ through our feeding events. And you might be able to do these feeding events in the Philippines as well. I don't have time to describe it, but maybe later I can share with you what a feeding event is. But Basically, in India, what they do is we send in a team of workers to an unreached village and we tell the villagers, hey, we're going to come back and people are going to be healed and then we're going to feed you. Now, when the villagers hear that, they say, wow, that's great. Uh, we're going to be healed and we're going to be fed. And so, when the day of the event arrives, the team arrives in this unreached village and all the villagers, they put on their nicest clothes and they gather together because people are going to be healed and they're going to be fed. It's, it's a big thing in an unreached village because in the village there's nothing going on at all. So when outsiders come in saying people are going to be healed and people are going to be fed, hundreds of people come and during the feeding event, first they preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and after that they heal the sick miraculously Great miracles happen as evidence that the gospel is true. And then hundreds of villagers raise their hands wanting to believe in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. And right away they plant a house church there. And after that they feed the people. I'm sure you can do this in the Philippines, I believe. Okay? This is possible, right? Yes. You can't do this in Bahrain, but you can do it in the Philippines. Okay? These are our 72 harvest workers that we sent out last year. Can this be done in the Philippines? Yes or no? Yes. yes. Will you do this someday back home? Yes or no? Yes. yes. You better do it. You know why? Because if you sit through this training today, you will be highly accountable before God. You know what I'm talking about? If you receive this training and you do nothing with it, then one day Jesus will say, how come you didn't apply what you were taught? How come you just, you just put it on the shelf and let it collect dust, okay? Are you sure you want to be here this morning? Because after I'm done with you, you're going to be very accountable before God. 
Is that what you want? Yes? Excellent. That's the right answer. About well over 10 years ago, I trained a pastor in Houston, Texas. His name was Carl Henderson. He came to our training. And then, about 10 years ago, he left for the Philippines as a missionary. He ministered in the Baguio area, okay? And what Carl did was he would train Fili Filipino believers, just like I'm training you, he would train them. And then he would send them to an unreached village. And in that village, they would look for the man of peace, according to Luke 10. And the man of peace was generally someone who needed healing for his family members. And they would find the man of peace. Uh-oh, we have a problem here. They would find the man of peace, and then these trained Filipino workers would minister healing to every sick family member in that man's home. Okay? Every sick family member would be miraculously healed. Amen. And after that, the whole family accepted Jesus Christ. All right? And then, what did they do? They would train this family how to heal the sick and cast out demons and preach the gospel. And then send these new believers out to preach the gospel to their family, to their friends, to their neighbors. And these were brand new believers who have been just trained by these harvest workers. And so, you see, when miracles happen, believers get so excited. New believers especially get so excited. So it's easy to teach them, and it's easy to send them out. And so, when these newly trained, newly saved believers went out to their neighbors, to their friends, preaching the gospel, healing the sick, many neighbors, many friends, family members would be healed and accept Christ. In that way, 51 house churches were planted in less than five months in the Philippines. Okay? And you can do this as well. We're going back to the Bible. We're going back to the Gospels. We're going back to the Book of Acts. 51 house churches in less than five months. Simply through trained harvest workers. We're in the last days. There's going to be an acceleration in missions. Missions as in Acts is being restored today. But we are not in the Philippines right now, are we? We're in Bahrain. So what about right here in Bahrain? What can we do? Well, I've saved that for later. I've saved that for later. Okay. Let's go to the teaching right now. Let's go to the Word of God. John 14, 6. Jesus answered, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Okay, there you have the Gospel. Jesus is the only way to the Father. He is the Messiah. And then verse 11, believe me when I say that I am in the Father and the Father is in me. In verse 11, Jesus says, believe my words. I tell you, I am in the Father, the Father is in me, I am one with the Father. Believe my words, or at least believe on the evidence of the works themselves. Works. What was Jesus referring to? He was referring to the miracles that he did. He performed miracles that only the one true God could perform. He opened the eyes of the blind, the ears of the deaf, healed the lame, raised the dead. And those works were the evidence that he was one with the Father, that he was the Son of God, that he was the Messiah. Okay? He got that. That was the primary purpose of the miracles that he did. He was providing evidence to the Jews that he was in fact the Son of God, the only way to the Father. All right? I hope that's clear. The primary purpose of all the miracles that Jesus did in the Gospels was not simply to show compassion to the sick, although he had compassion for the sick, but there was a greater purpose 
the greater purpose was for them to believe on him as the Messiah and receive eternal life because of the miracles. Now, look at verse 12. Very truly I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing. <clears throat> Who here believes in Jesus Christ? Raise your hand. Okay, I believe all of you believe in Jesus Christ. And Jesus says to you, very truly I tell you, you who believe in me will do the works I have been doing. You will do the miracles that I have been doing. You will heal the sick and cast out demons just as I have been doing. For what purpose? As evidence that our Lord Jesus is the Messiah, the only way to the Father. Do you believe this promise? Do you believe that promise? You should. If you're a born-again, spiritual believer, you believe that Scripture is authoritative and inspired, right? So all of you believe this, right? That believers will do the miracles that Jesus did, okay? How many of you are actually doing the miracles that Jesus did in your walk with Jesus Christ? How many of you are actually doing those miracles? I'm not going to embarrass you by asking you to raise your hand. How many of you are opening the eyes of the blind and opening the ears of the deaf? Many or very few? Many or very, very few? Come on. What's the answer? How many of you are doing the works that Jesus did? Raise your hand if you are really performing the miracles that Jesus did. Hmm. There's not many. There's just two in the front here. Okay. Now, so that means this promise is no good, right? promise is no good. There's only two people raised their hands and we have here, what, 150. So what's the problem here? Uh, was Jesus lying when he said that? No, he's not a liar. He's the way, the life, and the truth. So where's the problem? Come on. If it's not God's fault, whose fault is it? Our fault. Our fault. Yes. It's the fault of the church. The church has not taught us how to do the works that Jesus did. Got that? They haven't been taught. We have not been taught. Okay. And that's why I'm here. I'm going to address that problem. Okay. We have not been taught how to do the works that Jesus did. Do you actually believe that you will be able to do these works? Do you believe that you'll be able to do these works? Okay. Now, one of these days, I expect to receiving reports from you about the miracles God is using you to do. Amen. And if I don't receive reports from you, I'll be very disappointed. Okay? Is that a deal? Yeah. I expect to hear miracles. Reports of miracles. Otherwise, I'm wasting my time here. Okay? Because I'm not here just to talk. I'm here to equip you to perform these miracles. The works that you will be doing are compelling evidence that Jesus is the Son of God and that He's the only way to the Father. So now you understand why I'm here, right? Okay? Understand. I'm a drill instructor for Special Forces Kingdom of God. This is a boot camp. I'm sorry this is not your ordinary Sunday, uh, Friday service. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> but this is boot camp. And you're... Special Forces trainees. How do you like that? Amen. You like to be Special Forces? Amen. Yes? You like that? Ah. And now, I'm going to teach you to do the works in the same way that Jesus did them. Not according to our traditions, but in the same way that Jesus healed the sick and cast out demons. And so in a moment, we're going to examine how we normally, traditionally minister healing in the church. And then we will compare it to how Jesus did it in the Gospels. But first, let's look once more at the primary purpose of the miracles Jesus performed. I have to 
emphasize this over and over and over again so you understand the purpose of the miracles that Jesus did. John 20, verse 30. Jesus did many other miraculous signs in the presence of his disciples which are not recorded in this book. So we know that Jesus performed many, many, many miracles. Why were they recorded? Verse 31, these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Again, you understand the primary purpose of the miracles which Jesus performed, right? It was not simply out of compassion for infirm believers, but it was so that you may believe, that the world may believe, that the lost may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing, you will have eternal life in His name. Right? So I hope that's clear. You understand the primary purpose of this teaching. Okay? Not simply to minister to sick believers, although that's fine, I'm nothing against that. But there's a much greater purpose. It's called fulfilling the Great Commission. Amen. Which do you think has greater priority in God's sight? Ministering healing to sick believers or fulfilling the Great Commission? Which do you think has greater priority in God's sight? Yeah, fulfilling the Great Commission. You know, you're a born-again believer, right? You're going to heaven someday. Let's say you are sick. And, uh, and you die of a terminal disease. Where are you going? Heaven. Completely healed, right? So, although yeah, we mourn and we're sad, but is it really a tragedy? No, you're completely healed in heaven. But an unbeliever, if they die of a disease and they don't know who Jesus is, where are they going? Hell. You, see, you get what I'm talking about? You see what I'm talking about? Healing for believers is fine. I get it. I was a pastor. But the Great Commission, I believe, has far greater priority in the sight of God. Okay. And many unbelievers will not believe in Jesus unless they see miracles. Especially here in Bahrain. Very difficult. Very resistant. Unless they experience miracles. John 10, verse 37. Do not believe me unless I do the works of my Father. I repeat, Jesus said, do not believe me unless I do the works, the miraculous works of my Father. You see the importance which Jesus placed on the miracles that he did. He said, yeah, don't believe me. Don't believe that I am the Messiah unless I do the works of my Father, the miracles. Okay? But if I do them, even though you don't believe me, even though you don't believe what I say, believe the works that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. So we see the extreme importance of the miracles in the ministry of Jesus Christ when he appeared 2,000 years ago.